This was the IBIS-2 trial, which was an international trial uh, of almost 4,000 patients. Uh, they're not patients, in fact, they're high-risk women that don't have breast cancer. High-risk primarily because of three times the population. placebo daily for five years, so it's fully placebo controlled. And uh, the median follow-up is now five years, and we've had 125 cancers, 85 in the control population, and only 40 in the treatment population. So we've reduced breast cancer incidence by 53%. And the effects were slightly larger for ER-positive invasive cancers, 58%, uh, but we also saw a big effect on uh, DCIS and virtually no effect on estrogen receptor negative tumors. I think that's been a major, it is a major concern about prevention. If you're going to be giving drugs to, to well people, you want to make sure that the side effect profile is modest and controllable. Um, and the major serious side effect associated with aromatase inhibitors is bone loss leading to fractures. And in the early adjuvant trials where there was no attempt to control this, the fracture rate was about 50% higher in those receiving an aromatase inhibitor. In IBIS-2, everybody got a bone density scan, a DEXA scan at entry. Those that were osteoporotic had to take a bisphosphonate. Those that were osteopenic got additional DEXA scans and were given bisphosphonates as needed. And because of that, uh, we had virtually no increase in fracture rate. We had a tiny increase that wasn't even statistically significant. So uh, th that is a controllable side effect by baseline DEXA scans and bisphosphonates as needed. Now, other major side effects are essentially aches and pains and arthralgias, which uh, if you look at uncontrolled situations, people are convinced that almost everybody gets them that takes an aromatase inhibitor. Well, we found Yes, we did find a large effect. We found 64% of the patients that took anastrozole reported aches and pains, but in fact, 58% of those taking placebo did. So there was a real increment, but in fact, it was only about 10% of the cases, and 90% of the arthralgias uh, are not associated with drug. They're just uh, essentially uh, related to, to uh, aging. Most of them sort of resolve over a short time. Um, I think one of the real challenges now is that it is true that women of this age, if they're going to take these drugs, are going to have aches and pains. And, um, you know, simple strategies like just taking a bit more exercise probably are going to be the effective way to control this. I think there's a lot to be done. Um, for severe things, I think probably challenge tests where you stop the treatment for a while and see if it goes away. If it doesn't, then it's probably not treatment related. Uh, are going to be important. That's going to be a challenge to sort of learn how to, how to treat this and manage this. But the exciting finding, I think, is that really it's not drug-related in 90% of the cases. At the moment, uh, anastrozole is used just simply as the treatment of choice for postmenopausal women with breast cancer that's receptor positive. So this is the first report of its use utility in high-risk women. And I think there'll be an effort now to sort of <clears throat> make it more widely accepted. There really are two issues, and they are interrelated, is that uh, an effective way of controlling breast cancer is, first of all, you need to identify more accurately who's at increased risk and where these drugs really make sense. And then the second fact, of course, is finding drugs which are effective but have minimal toxicity, which can be tolerated. So the trial has basically demonstrated that we have an improvement in both efficacy. This is a better drug than tamoxifen, more efficacious in terms of reducing risk, and serious side effects are substantially reduced. So we have a better drug. The next challenge, I think, now is to more accurately and more actively begin to identify high-risk women who should consider this. And I think we can learn a lot from the cardiologists. Uh, they've convinced the world that high blood pressure or high cholesterol is actually a disease. It's simply a risk factor like family history for breast cancer. And it's quite routine, of course, to first of all try simple things like diet and exercise, but for the higher risk individuals because of cholesterol or, or high blood pressure, drugs are now standardly used and have had a major effect. 
So I think there's a big challenge to bring that mentality into cancer, and this is a, a step forward. For very high-risk women, most people don't realize that she, she was a BRCA1 carrier, which is very rare. The risk is high, and that's an appropriate uh, option for that group. But most women at increased risk are not BRCA1 or BRCA2 carriers. They have family histories that are not associated with, with these genetic mutations. They have other risk factors. So their risk is, you know, the order of maybe 20 or 30 percent lifetime risk as opposed to her 85 percent lifetime risk. And there, if you could reduce that by 50 percent or more, bring it back down to more like the population risks, that I think is a very attractive strategy if side effects are acceptable.